Hello, David McKinster here. Uh, this is a video lecture over uh, absurdity as part of the uh, Philosophy 366 Existentialism course. The readings, of course, concentrated on Albert Camus. His um, The Myth of Sisyphus is one of the classic texts, if you will, of, uh, of absurdity. Um, what do we mean by absurdity? Well, absurdity is a response, if you will, to, uh, to the natural tension between the human desire for order and explanation and understanding and the arbitrariness, lawlessness, if you will, of the world. Okay? Um, it begins with the observation that there is no objective meaning to life. It's not out there to be found. It's not in nature. In fact, if you took my ethics course, you, you're familiar with the term the naturalistic fallacy and its most recent popular incarnation as if nature and good are, uh, are natural and good are um, synonyms, which of course they're not. Something can be natural and yet be very undesirable from a human standpoint. You know, it's natural for a uh, you know, for an, some object in space, an asteroid or something, to, uh, to smash into the Earth, being once every, say, 300,000 years, and cause significant damage or um, actually an extinction-level event. Um, it's natural to have pandemics, okay? So <laughs> nature, as one scientist of my acquaintance put it, nature wants four of your seven children dead by the age of five. Nature wants you to lose all your teeth and die while you're in your 40s. Okay, if you're looking for pattern and meaning in nature, so understand that you know, essentially you're making up stories after the fact. That's the point. Nature doesn't care about you. Okay? Um, although pretending that it does uh, certainly has been an effective marketing strategy for, uh, for many products and services. Okay, there's no objective meaning to life. It's not, there's not a meaning out there to be found. Okay, one other, why would we ever think so? Why would we ever think there was? Well, one thing is that we do have just... <laughs> neurologically, we want to find patterns. Okay, and you combine that with a long, long heritage of believing that there are that there is intelligence behind whatever happens rather than it simply being random. And you have this, you have that uh, you have that toxic formula that says that you know we, we should be making up the meaning of life based on tradition, based on wishful thinking, based on, if you will, bad faith. And life doesn't have a meaning. One of the reasons that, uh, that absurdism grew was the failure of uh, what some people call modernism. One way to characterize modernism is the belief that you can find a system that can be rationally understood that will explain why life is as it is, will explain to us what we need to do in order to uh, uh, make life as good, as desirable as we could possibly make it, completely discounts the role of simply random occurrences, and completely discounts the irrational. Okay, take a look, and I will, I will make this example, take a look at contemporary United States. Okay, just as an example. Um, we have made tremendous scientific uh, progress, which essentially means we've used reason and experimental reasoning, especially in order to understand how the world works and how to understand how we can reduce our own suffering and maximize uh, those elements that help us to thrive. Now, try to get people to listen to it. 
No, they've made up all kinds of stories, and they have such an extreme emotional investment in those stories that they won't listen. You tell them something different, and you're just either in one of those arrogant scientists, or, or um, you're part of some vast conspiracy, or you're just not sufficiently woke to understand their enlightened perspective. Um, well, the existentialists would say, and you know, th those who appreciate absurdism would say, um, they're fooling themselves. This is just bad faith. Okay, you don't, you know, you, you see in, in modern times the breakdown of the assumptions of religious culture, that there will always be an answer and it will always be a religious answer. And uh, I think I've mentioned before, uh, going into a bookstore a number of years ago uh, around Christmas time with a friend, and the friend was an outspoken atheist, and we saw there was an end cap you know, t with books that are being featured, and they were all books on atheism. She said she, she was delighted to see all these books on atheism, but uh, being an atheist herself, but she said, why? Why is atheism so big? And I said, well, atheism is really big this Christmas because people who claim to speak for the major religions have been behaving so badly. They've sort of blown any credibility they might have. Um, well, we've seen wars, persecutions, all manner of injustices. We've seen defense of privilege. We've seen all kinds of things that are normally we would say are undesirable and that would seem to be contrary to professed morality. And we've seen them advocated, supported, or even initiated by various religious institutions. So, and on top of that, on top of that, we have explanations now evidence-based explanations for all kinds of things that we previously depended upon religious stories to explain to us. Okay? Uh, it used to be faith was the ultimate justification. And that got be replaced with reason. Okay? At least in some spheres, Athens beat Jerusalem. <laughs> okay? You know, reason... If reason and faith were in conflict with one another, being irrational in your faith was, was not highly looked upon. And the reason being for that being that, you know, as Christopher Hitchens put it, you base, uh, you know, you base your medicine on science, you save lives, you base your engineering on science, you know, your buildings don't fall down, etc., etc., etc. And you achieve concluded, it works, bitches. Okay. <laughs> um, well, so anthropology, physics, psychology, archaeology, all of these various disciplines have, uh, have shown us that 